the fourth edition of the Forbes India Leadership Award. The entrepreneur of for the year. And the winner is Dilip Shangri, MD, Sun Fund. It's a big list of questions. Actually, it's three pages, sir. Oh. <laughs> but they just told me we have only ten minutes, and that your company is in a quiet period because of earnings next week. So, so I, I'm, I'm going to try and weed out all the financial questions. So that's two pages gone. Okay. Uh, the new greeting in town, sir, is Kim Cho. Uh, that's what that's President Obama said to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. That's true. Kim true. Cho. Kim. Mayama. Ah, FDA wala masuk hai kya? Huh? <laughs> it's part of life. Okay, so. that is that is Gujarati for are these regulators chewing your brain? Anyways, uh, let me start. Actually, uh, you know, the perception people have of Sun and of you is that it's an understated company uh, that you let all your work do your talking, which makes an interview very difficult. Uh, so I'm I'm going to ask you questions. Uh, about things that I would like to know about you, and I'm sure our audience wants to as well. My first question is, do you have a, a leadership philosophy of some sort? And the reason why I ask you this is today, uh, Sun has, you know, risen to be one of India's brightest, most successful, and in practice, aggressive companies as well. So what is your leadership philosophy, your management philosophy? If you could start off by talking about that, then I'll dive in deeper after that. I think as a company, we focus on uh, doing what we do well. And uh, we've seen with experience that to, to be able to do what we want to do well, we have to follow some basic uh, principles. The first focus that we have on is uh, to have loyalty of the people who constitute the Sun team. Because we've seen that uh, when we have continuity of people, when they work well together as a team, we are able to get extraordinary performance out of average people. The second philosophy that we've focused on is uh, we want to fo uh, retain loyalty of our investors. Uh, and if I see in Sun, uh, we've average investor age of more than six and a half, seven years, which I am told is significantly higher than the industry, and which allows us to run the business in the long-term interest of our, all the stakeholders. And the third important component that we focus on is loyalty of our customers. And uh, We've seen that uh, the loyalty of customers that we focused on in India in different specialities, different doctors, uh, has allowed us to grow consistently faster than the industry. In discovering these three very important contributors to your success, you must have had several failures. Every successful person in the world has had. What would you sort of define or point to as the most important failure that you've had, the one that you've learned the most from, probably the turning point of your life? I mean, I don't think I've had a failure which uh, has been a turning point, point of life, but uh, the failure which taught us a lot of things is uh, the problem that we have with the regulatory agency in our facility in the U.S. Uh, and uh, we realize that uh, compliance for us as a company and focusing on uh, manufacturing, GMP systems, quality, uh, will ultimately determine our success as a company. And uh, that allowed us to focus on uh, strengthening our capability, and that I would consider to be an important component of our growth. Would you say the Indian pharmaceutical industry is learning that lesson only now, even though you had that experience many years ago first? So my sense is that uh, over last five years, uh, uh, India has become an important source of pharmaceutical products for the U.S. market. 
and uh, there is a expectation of the U.S. Congress with the agency that uh, they would treat uh, international suppliers in line with the way in which they would treat suppliers from within the U.S. So they are creating kind of a same level of inspection and uh, audit that a typical U.S. company needs to go through because we have facilities in the U.S. and we have facilities in India. So we don't see that uh, the facilities in the India are in any way treated differently from the way in which our facilities in the U.S. are treated. What is the hallmark of Sun has been, you know, for those of us who look at it from the outside, has been its incredible acquisitive nature. Mm -hmm. So I think since you listed in 1994, I think there was a period of almost 10 years where you were doing an acquisition a year. I'm not saying they were all large, you know, big ticket acquisitions. Sure. Some were plants, some were product portfolios. But since you're listing in 1994 and we're in 2014 right now, you've done, I think, between 16 to 18 acquisitions, yes, if I've counted that correctly. Now, it's well known in the world of M&A that two out of three deals fail in your assessment because publicly you've had no failure in your assessment have they all been successes have you ever failed and if you've never failed what is the secret to your success so I think uh, classical definition of a failed acquisition is value destruction so I don't think uh, we have a single failure till now uh, because we may not have achieved our objective of creating the value that we thought that we will do when we did the acquisition. So we may not have met our internal benchmark, but we've not, never failed really. And actually is your biggest, most audacious move? That's correct. Uh, it catapults you to number five, uh, you know, within global pharma across the world. Mm -hmm. Are you going to buy your way into number one? <laughs> No, I, I, I think uh, we are not preoccupied with size. I, I don't think that uh, becoming number one will give us any pleasure. Uh, if, let's say, in the process we become a better company, if we become a stronger company, if we become a company capable of managing our future more effectively than what we are able to do without the acquisition, we would do that. I like that phrase, managing our future. Can you spell what that means? I mean, can you sort of detail or elaborate what that means, managing your future? I, I, I have a reason for why I'm asking you that, but yeah, after sure. your answer, I'll tell you why. So, so I think if you see world over, you have so many challenges. You have challenges of economic stress that the healthcare system is facing worldwide. Then you have economic uncertainty that the economies worldwide are facing. Then you have challenges of new emerging technologies which are likely to upset the way the people are treated. So in an environment which is so uncertain and in an environment which uh, creates new challenges. Uh, if some acquisition equips you to manage those challenges more effectively, then I would consider that we, we can manage our future more effectively. Okay. The reason why I was asking was because, you know, in the course of doing some research for this interview, and so it's really difficult because you don't do too many interviews, right? So it's very, very tough to get into your head. But you said once in an interview that my limitation is that I don't have a clear vision beyond this year. I try and stay focused on what I need to deliver this year. So I'm just curious, you don't work to a five-year, 10-year, 15-year planning commission kind of style plan of any no, sort? No, I, I don't have that capacity. So it's 12 months? I think, 12, 18, no, no, I think time. typically we would have a frozen plan for this year and a tentative expectation for the next two years. But that's tentative. And the reason why we don't do rigid five-year planning is that at any point of time we are working on large number of variables and some of them may succeed, some of may, them may not. And if we succeed in, let's say, a few more strategies that we are working on, then it changes our cash flow profile, it changes our ability to take risk. And uh, that would then change our plan for the subsequent period. 
So that's the reason why we don't plan so far out in future. So tongue in cheek in 2009, you didn't know that you were going to buy Rand Maxi? No, I mean in beginning You didn't of laugh when Daichi paid that much money for it? No, in the beginning of this year, we didn't know that we were okay. buying Rand Maxi. <laughs> All right. You know, I get what you're saying about managing the future, about not hard coding five year plans. In, but one of the things I understand that you have been working on, uh, you know, in an, a deliberate sort of long term fashion, is professionalizing your management. And I don't mean to say that earlier it was not professional, uh, but we just, uh, you know, over the last two years, you've brought in, uh, you know, your chairman is Israel Makov of sure. Teva, formerly. You are building in that bandwidth in your company. And in fact, when you acquired ran back to you as well, you said in an interview that we've been preparing our management structure for an acquisition of this size, of this nature, something that catapults us into the big league. Talk us through how you're giving up control now to a new generation of managers in your company, including one sitting above you as the chairman of your board. No, true. I think uh, as business becomes bigger, uh, the cost of mistake that you make also becomes bigger. So we felt that at our size, uh, if we can avoid a few mistakes and take a few right steps, then it will help us grow much faster. And the next level of our growth is going to be on two broad areas. One is managing innovation effectively, and second is internationalizing our business effectively. And for both of this, we had limited the bandwidth and experience within the company. So that was the reason why we decided to strengthen the company by getting a CEO who, I mean, chairman who has done this. He took company from $600 million to maybe close to $10 billion in less than 10 years. So we can learn from how he could do this and uh, that would strengthen our processes and capacity. Has it been difficult to, oh, in a sense, seat control to a more professional team? Do you envisage a day when the Shanghais are not in management control, management control, I'm not talking about ownership control, management control sure. of Sun, five years, well, okay, you don't do five-year planning, but 10, 15, 20 years from now. I think ultimately the business needs to uh, sustain beyond an individual. Then you've created a long-lasting business. And that, I think, uh, would be the objective of every uh, what, what I would call CEO who wants to perpetuate his uh, legacy. But sir, look around in the room, actually not in this room, but in other rooms, you will see that Indian promoters find it very difficult to give up. I have never looked at myself in uh, only one uh, format, which is let's say promoter. I always evaluate my performance as a manager, independent of that as an owner. And at some point of time, let's say when we uh, requested Israel to take over as a chairman, I felt that as a manager I needed help. So yeah, that's a big admission, sir. Sure, that's a of big course. admission. And it's, it's lovely and refreshing to hear you say that. Sure. Because in the biggest of companies, sure. you know, promoter managers rarely ever do that kind of introspection or take a step back and say, I need help, can I get it from outside? Sure. So. Sure. Uh, was it difficult emotionally from no. an ego point of view? No? No. no, no. Never? Never.